Howie Rose here, and we go one-on-one -on -one today with a player who kind of sneaked into town when he became a New York Met, but he left setting a record. And that is former Mets outfielder and infielder Joel Youngblood. Great to see you again, Joel. Thank you, Hal. It's great to be here. It's, it's always a pleasure to come back to New York and especially be a part of the Mets again. Well, I've got to kind of tie together that reference about how you sneaked into town <laughs> as you were traded kind of at the back end of what came to be known as the Midnight Massacre when Tom Seaver and Dave Kingman were traded. And uh, right at the end of all that, you came over from the St. Louis Cardinals. But it was when Joel Youngblood left town that they did it in record-breaking fashion. And I'm just going to let you roll with this. A base hit off of Fergie Jenkins at Wrigley Field. Then you find out, you get traded, and take it from there. Well, we're, we're, in, we're uh, in Chicago playing a day game. And uh, so, you know, normally you get to the ballpark about 10 o'clock. And so uh, we're sitting there, and I'm in the lineup. I'm playing center field, and I'm batting in the top of the lineup. And my first at bat. I get a base hit, knock in a run, and and uh, then I was taken out of the game, and I, I was like, "Wait a minute!" That early, like really? I early? like the third inning, and I and so I went up and I said, "Wait, wait a minute! I have a chance to have a good game here." <laughs> and uh, he said, "You just been traded to the Montreal Expos. They're short players. They would like you to do everything you can to get there." And I said, "Absolutely, I'll do my best." So at that time, you know, all my friends are right here in the dugout. And so I'm telling everybody goodbye and shaking hands. And, and, uh, and I said, okay. And they said, okay, you're, the only flight you can catch is 6.05. So let's just say three innings in Chicago. It's probably 2.30 already. I'm still in uniform. Now I, I have to go take a shower, pay my incidentals, go get a cab, go to the hotel, pack my bags, get back in a cab. And on the way to, to O'Hare Airport, I realized I left my glove on the facing at Wrigley Field. So I, I used the same glove for 14 years, so I said, we got to go back. And so we went back, I ran inside, told everybody hello again, and then I grabbed my glove and I ran back in the cab and I said, look, you got to get me to the airport. I said, I'll give you a big tip. It was like 5 o'clock. Trying so, to get to O'Hare. O'Hare. Rush hour at yes. 5 o'clock. So, Can't be done. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we, we make it and, and I get on the plane, but I said, there's no way my luggage is going to make it. And so. Two hour flight, one hour uh, time difference. So I leave really at 7.05, I land at 9.05 Philadelphia time, wait for my luggage, it comes out. I said, great, go out, whistle a cab down and uh, take me to Veterans so Stadium. You got, you got luggage, batting, you got your glove. Oh, you're you batting equipment. equipment. Oh yeah, yeah. you're batting everything. And Taxi, so, <laughs> that's, that's gotta be a great <laughs> so look. So I'm walking like this, you know, and I, I go down the elevator and, uh, and so as soon as I get there, cause I know Pete Rose is playing on the other team, and he was my idol when I played, and, and uh, uh, I put my uniform on and went and sat on the stairs like he did, and I'm looking, and he kind of looked over, and I went like that, waved, and the next thing I know, he, get a bat, young blood, you're up. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I walked up, and I got a base hit, and it was Steve Carlton was pitching. Uh, but it turned out that I got two hits, but in reality, you know, when, when Tom uh, Carlton didn't, uh, pitch on the road games when he was in Clearwater and we were in Tampa, he used to come over to Tampa all the time and pitch the minor leaguers for his work. He had struck me out probably a hundred times before <laughs> I even got to the big leagues. So I, I knew what I couldn't hit. I knew what I could hit off of him. So. You knew you were getting a slider from him, right? Oh, I knew not to swing at that slider. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you hit for your I, base hit? You know, quite frankly, I don't know. Wow. I really don't know. And, and you know what else? I, I was here yesterday and somebody told me that they, somebody sent him a text and said they had my bat that I used in, 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 in Chicago. And they asked me if I would want it. And I said, absolutely. And, and, I, and, he, and I said, you sure it's my bat? And he said, it says gamer on the bottom of it. And I used to write gamer on the bottom of my bats. So that means, please, nobody else use this bat because this is my gamer. You can use anything else, but not that one. So if it was, I, I, I think it's a strong strong opportunity it is. Now you said something else as you were talking about packing and getting ready to make the trip from Chicago to Philadelphia. You used one glove? All the positions, you didn't use the same glove say at second base that you did in the outfield, did you? Yeah. We, wow. I didn't have the hands that Doug Flynn had. <laughs> <laughs> I needed a little bit bigger glove. I felt more confident. But you played all over the place. Well, it's unusual, right? To but see my an third infielder. base glove really was a very small outfielder's glove. So it wasn't really that big. Uh, I always felt in the outfield, you, you need a glove that you can control the ball. If you can touch it, you need to catch it. Uh, so in the outfield, the glove, you'd 
it, it'd be at the out, you'd pull your hand out a little bit, so I made it longer because uh, it was a fast back and you'd tighten it, hinch it up. Uh, but uh, I felt comfortable with that glove. Well, you seem to feel pretty comfortable with the Mets, too, because you fit right in when you came over in the midst of that storm yeah. that enveloped the Mets and everybody else. Did you feel like you had to tiptoe in here, or were you even noticed when you showed up the well, first time? Well, honestly, you know, coming up with the Reds with such a, a great lineup, you know, our opportunities to play were limited. And, you know, then I went to St. Louis in spring training because Vern Rapp was my AAA manager, and he took me over there. And so I went from George Foster, Sedan, uh, Geronimo, and Ken Griffey to uh, Bake McBride, Lou Brock, and then we had Jerry Mumphrey, Tony Scott, and myself, and, and Andy Anderson, I think that was his name. And uh, I had a great spring. You know, I, I was 20 for 40, four home runs. Uh, Tony Scott got the start because he was a switch hitter. He hit 300 that year, so nobody got to play. I got 27 at bats in three months. So in the trade deadline, Vern Rapp called me up and says, you're not going to get a chance to play here. I'm going to trade you to New York. And I said, thank you. And so when I got here, I kind of had to go backwards again because Danny Norman and Steve Henderson were behind me in Cincinnati, but now they're in this big trade and now they're in front of me, and so I had to sit back again and wait for my opportunities. And if it wasn't for Buddy Harrelson getting, breaking his, was Buddy, right, broke his wrist? The shortstop? In 77, yeah. And Doug Flynn went to, to, short, uh, to shortstop. It was between me and Bobby Valentine who was going to play. And, and I, 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 was, I was able to get more playing time, so it gave me a little bit of, of they noticed me a little bit, you know, an, an infielder, you know, and I didn't have that good of a year, but I had a better year than I had in the past in the big leagues. And uh, so it kind of opened the door for uh, Torrey to give me more opportunities because he saw some good days and he saw some bad days, but it opened up my door for me. And you had some pretty good years here, one of which was uh, an all-star selection in 1981. But I want to go back to the year before briefly because that's when the ownership changed and the marketing slogan, the magic is back, was uh, very prominently featured yeah. in New York. And so opening day comes up, first game under the new ownership, playing the Cubs. There's not that many people in the stands for opening day because there was a wait and see attitude the fans took. But however many there were, made a whole lot of noise. And I forget who hit <laughs> the ball now, but I remember you went up to the top of the bullpen fence in right field, took a home run away from somebody. Bittner. So you obviously remember that play. <laughs> Speak. Okay, well, well. <laughs> Craig Swan's pitching, and he, he always threw extremely well, and he always held the teams down. And I think we were winning one to nothing, or and there was one run on it, and it was a two-run home run. I climbed the fence and went over the fence and caught it and brought it back. Mm -hmm. It was probably my most memorable moment in baseball because the fans in New York gave me a standing ovation, and so it really, it really touched me pretty good. They appreciated the effort I made to catch that ball, and uh, especially in the eighth inning, and and uh, so it really kind of. I think it laid the foundation for me uh, to, uh, to, to, to be a part of this team. And, and uh, it's kind of funny, you know, we were talking about this. I, 80, 81, what, let me see, 79 in 1980. We got Kingman in 80, right? Uh, 81. 81. Well, with yeah. the starting lineup that day, I was batting third, and Kingman was batting fourth, and we were standing up on the, on the line, and they were getting ready to play the national anthem, and I said, Hey, 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 Dave, aren't you glad you have somebody to protect you? <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me and started laughing, but, you know, that's the way I was, you know. I mean, it, but it was kind of funny. It brings back memories of all the, all the, the good times we had here as a New York Yeah, night. and, you know, you talk about laughing and stuff, and I was a young reporter around that clubhouse, yeah. enough to get a feel for the fact that whether you guys were winning or losing, it, it seemed to be, and I remember talking to Neil Allen about this recently when we had him on one of these spots, a particularly close-knit bunch of guys for a team that was going to be moving people in and around trying to find the right combination. What, what made a core of you guys as close as you seem to have been? Well, I, I think it's the basic uh, ingredient of all teams. Um, everybody comes together and tries to play the best they can to win because it's more fun to win than it is to lose. And not everybody can win. And, uh, but, you know, when I look back and I look at all the young talent we had, uh, you know, it had to be tough for Joe Torrey because of our inconsistencies. Uh, we didn't understand how to control the disciplines to be more successful on a, on a consistent basis. And we knew we had the ability to play 
as well as other people, but we weren't consistent enough to be noticed as much as other people. So it, it's a learning curve for young players to try to find their own, to realize we have to adapt and rise to, to the competition. And with our, with our abilities and our skill sets and our fundamentals, and uh, uh, it just takes a little time to understand that. And I think that type of, of I call it education. Uh, I think it really comes through the coaching staff that have a lot of experience because they're, they're able to shorten the gap of your learning curve. So you're, you're, you're here and you have a chance to be a very successful player here, but if you can shorten that curve, you can give an organization five or six more years of, of top-notch playing uh, abilities. Who among Joe's coaches that you played for in those five years might have done that for you, if anyone? I think Joe more than anybody. I've always said this, Joe Torrey was the most impressive manager I've ever played for. Um, he was just starting out as a manager. Just starting out, but his attitude and, and his sincerity and the space he would give you and the freedom he would give you. And, and I played for a lot of good managers, you know, D Doug Flynn and I and the rest of the Reds. Sparky was a great guy. He didn't really associate with the young guys. He did with the, big, the older guys. Uh, but, you know, Roger Craig was a good manager. I loved playing for him, but Joe was special, you know, and as you, as you found out with the New York Yankees, he was a special manager. Everybody loved him. Everybody wanted to play hard for him, as well as we did, you know, and, and uh, but Joe was very special. It's easy for you to say now, but you ended his career. Because he told me that too. It's true. It's true. When, when <laughs> Joe Torrey became manager of the Mets for the first couple of weeks, he was actually the player manager. And when Joel was acquired from the St. Louis Cardinals, in order to make room on the roster, Joe said, that's it, I quit. He, and, and literally, yeah, he retired that is true. to get you onto the roster, That is didn't true, he? that is true. That is very much true. And, uh, you know, uh, being, looking back at, at my younger age, and, and uh, I saw Joe when he was the manager of the Dodgers, and I was with the Diamondbacks, and um, I walked up to him, and I said, Joe, Joe, I said, I said, you know you're my favorite. <laughs> he says, I know. And I said, I just want to apologize because I, I, I wasn't that good of a guy all the time. <laughs> he said, don't worry about it, Joel. What would you have changed? Or oh, well, I, 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 because I didn't realize the responsibilities and the outlook from management. I, only, we, I could only see what I wanted as a player what I wanted to be in the lineup. Now you preferred playing the outfield to the infield, Oh, right? yeah, yeah, but I'm just was saying, that... I didn't understand. I mean, for instance, <clears throat> one time I came in the clubhouse and I was hitting the ball really good, and that was my bread and butter. If I'm, you know, if I'm hitting, please use me, because I can help. And I wasn't in the lineup, and it just, I got so upset, I just tore it up and threw it in the trash can. You know, and I know he knew it was me, and he didn't say a word to me. If it was me being the manager, I would have, I would have lost it. But I didn't understand being in that position, looking from that perspective, the respect I should have gave uh, my coaches and, and my manager. And, you know, and especially with the internet now, it's easy to look back at somebody's career, you know, and, you know, and I, I, didn't, I didn't really realize at that time that Joe was that great of a player. He was a phenomenal player. I spent many a days at, in the office with him talking about hitting, and he gave me a little tape that he had, and, uh, you know, he was, he was, he was, he was great. Okay, so if you, if you look back on your career with the Mets, if there is one play, whether you've been able to see it on the internet or not, or one moment in your career that's not readily talked about, but that's close to your heart, anything come to mind? Well, we kind of mentioned it first. My, my whole outlook in outfield was to throw people out and catch balls over the fence. Uh, because we're not, outfielders are not out there to catch a, a fly ball. They're out there to catch the unexpected fly ball, the one that nobody expects you to catch. You're training to catch the unbelievable play, not the one that you're supposed to. I tell, when, I, when, I, when I coached outfielders, I told my outfielders, I said, if you can't catch a fly ball, go take ground balls in the infield. I said, your job is not just to catch a fly ball. Your job is to make the unbelievable play, the diving catch, climbing the fence. You know, and, uh, and I, think, I think that goes hand in hand with everybody else. You know? I mean, they're not out there to catch the ground ball right to them. They're out there to catch the diving ball to the backhand side and get up and throw the runner out. That's what the fans want to see, the spectacular plays. So you did that for yeah. the New York Mets, and it is great to see you back here in New York. I'm just loving that all the alumni are coming back yeah. almost one by one, and so it's great to catch up with you, Joe. Howie, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's, it's always a pleasure to be back in New York. It's, it's, 
it was my favorite team to play for. It's the favorite city to play in. And I think it's my favorite fans because they know, they know all about you. They know what you're saying and they want to see you back it up. And it doesn't have to be with total performance, but it has to be with effort. And if you do that, you're liked here. Our thanks to Joel Youngblood. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.